Hey everyone, how is it going tonight? Uh, today, hope you're doing well. Uh, so excited to to be here on another episode um, of Dr. Sumner's Summit to Wellness. Thanks so much for joining, Dr. Pennicott. Good to see you, Janice. Thanks so much for uh, coming on board. Um, so excited to be here again, guys. And uh, Sorry for a slight tardiness, but we're um, back on track, and I'm um, excited to have you guys here with me tonight. So definitely um, bring those that you love on board uh, so we can have a healthy discussion today. All right, so I'm really excited, really excited to be back um, on another episode today, guys. Um, hi, Janice. Thanks so much for joining Hi, Simone. Thanks for joining. Um, so we're here on our next live airing of Dr. Sumner's Summit to Wellness. And I am Dr. Sumner. I am your board certified family medicine and family medicine physician and wellness strategist. I am dedicated to empowering you and your communities to become well. And to me, that's whole, energized, and loving life. I currently do this through speaking engagements, telemedicine services, and online coaching services. And I also need to just remind you briefly of a disclaimer that as much as I truly, truly enjoy helping to inform you about topics related to your health and wellness, this is not medical advice. This is for informational purposes only. So if you have any specific questions related to your individual diagnosis or treatment plan, then please, please, please discuss them with your doctor. And if I'm not your doctor and you'd like me to be, then please message me or click uh, on my book me link on the Facebook page or on my website and I'd be happy to get you set up for an appointment. All right, so good to see you guys. Thanks so much, Tay, for uh, joining us. Um, so I currently see patients in the states of Pennsylvania and Georgia online, and it'd be my pleasure to see you. Okay, so now that the fun disclaimers are out of the way, just a reminder that this is the last Thursday of American Heart Month, also the last Thursday of Black History Month of February. And for the past few live sessions, we've been discussing topics related to heart health, specifically heart disease. We talked about the test you need to ask your doctor if you want to better assess your risk of heart disease. And last week, we discussed how the kinds of bacteria in your gut can have a huge impact on your risk of heart disease. And today, we're going to talk about a topic so near and dear to me because I have a lot of people near and dear to me currently suffering from this disease, and that's high blood pressure, also known as hypertension. So this is a disease that affects way, way too many people. So if you know, uh, if you or someone you know, if they're at risk of, or if they're currently suffering from high blood pressure, this is a talk that I don't think you should miss. So tag your loved ones right now and share with those that you care about, okay? And if you're watching now, please comment. Even if you're catching the replay, say hi or type in hashtag replay so I can see who's joined because uh, I really appreciate you guys coming on. And I do think that this talk will be of great, great value to you. So, so excited to have you here. All right. Hi, Mia. Thanks for joining. So. As I was saying, the range of people that hypertension affects is huge. 50 million Americans, 50 million Americans are labeled with hypertension. And there are over 1 billion people worldwide with this diagnosis. And hypertension, it contributes to more than 1,000 deaths per day, 1,000 deaths per day. And recent research even suggests that even a high normal blood pressure, which would be a blood pressure of like 120 to 129 over 80 to 84, even a normal high blood pressure increases the risk of death from heart disease by 46% on average. And what's even more concerning and startling to me, especially as a mommy, is the CDC says that now three to four percent of children have high blood pressure, hypertension, and 10% more of the, those have prehypertension. 
So the risk is bad enough overall that one third of the US population has high blood pressure, but that risk is almost doubled amongst the African American community. So all of this is basically saying this is too much and we've just got to do something to stop it. Thanks so much, I'm just TL for joining. Uh, thanks Terry for joining, good to see ya. Hi Denise, thanks for joining. Uh, so before we get there, let me briefly go over with you guys what blood pressure really is and what those numbers, the 120 over 80, that magic number, what that really means, right? So basically, um, blood pressure, it's expressed as a fraction and it's measured in milligrams of mercury. So for example, we hear that term 120 over 80 milligrams of mercury, MMHG is what they say. So the top number, like this is what's a normal blood pressure, right? The top number um, refers to systolic blood pressure. And so if we say 120, if we say 120 over 80, it'd look like this. You know, that's how we would um, write a blood pressure. So the top number refers to the systolic blood pressure. And that's, the, that's when we measure the pressure or the force of blood in the arteries or the blood vessels when the heart beats or squeezes. And the bottom number, or the 80, for example, um, is what we call diastolic blood pressure. And that measures the pressure in the arteries between the heart squeezing, between the heartbeats, or when the heart relaxes. So blood, me blood pressure measurements, they fall into four different categories of risk. So we have normal blood pressure, and that's considered a blood pressure of less than 120 over 80. Then we have prehypertension, and that's a blood pressure of 120 to 139 over 80 to 89. Then there's stage one hypertension. That's when you're officially told, oh, you have high blood pressure. You've been diagnosed with high blood pressure. Stage one hypertension is a blood pressure of 140 to 159 over 90 to 99. And stage two hypertension is a blood pressure of more than 160 over 100. God forbid you are higher than that. If you are above 180 over 110, that's what we call a hypertensive crisis. It's a legit emergency. And I'm sorry for those on Instagram, it's backwards. On Facebook, it's not backwards. It's so confusing. I do apologize. Um, but hopefully you can still follow along. But we're done with words for the rest of the video. Um, so basically, we, we now know that what's classified as a high blood pressure, okay? So above or 140 over 90 is what we call hypertension or high blood pressure. Hi, Marsh. Thanks so much for joining. Um, hi, Dr. Kalani, thanks for joining. So I often get the question, like, when is my blood pressure too low? Do you ever ask your doctor that, or have you been curious about what is it when your blood pressure is too low? So let me first ask you a question. What do you think is the most common cause of low blood pressure? What do you think is the most common cause of low blood pressure? And I'll answer that question for you as to what is considered a low blood pressure. So regarding what is a best versus a too low blood pressure, for a lot of people, normal or good blood pressure can actually be quite different. Um, so really the best blood pressure is the lowest blood pressure where you still feel good. So that blood pressure, it may be 120 over 80 for some people, but it could be 110 over 70 for someone else. And there are actually people walking around with blood pressures of like 98 over 58, and they feel great. So that's a normal best blood pressure for them. But when you start to feel lightheaded or dizzy or woozy or tired, or God forbid you pass out, that's definitely when we know your blood pressure is too low, okay? And the most common cause of blood pressure being too low, let me see if 
uh, what some of you guys have said. Simone said some medications. Uh, I'm just, Yell said not eating, she's not sure. So yeah, the most common cause of blood pressure being too low is pharmaceutical, it's medications. So um, if you feel lightheaded, dizzy, woozy, tired, and you're on any blood pressure medications, definitely check your blood pressure, please. And if you're normal or lower than normal, what we consider normal, then have a conversation with your doctor that could be too low for you. So speaking of medications, many of the most common side effects are related to blood pressure being over-treated. So you, may, you might feel lightheaded or dizzy or tired or you get a headache from your medications. Um, the most common side effect in a class called ACE inhibitors, which tend to end in um, the suffix pril, P-R-I-L, like lisinopril, enalapril, captopril, um, the most common side effect of those medications tend to be a cough. They say like 10% of people get a cough with it. Personally, I think I've seen more than 10% of people, um, <clears throat> but that tends to be the case. So some people are then switched to a different class of medication called ARBs, angiotensin receptor blockers. Unfortunately, ARBs have received a lot of bad press lately because there's been some now proven correlation between um, some of them and increased risk of cancer. ARBs tend to be, they tend to end in a suffix called sartan, like valsartan or low sartan. So if you have a side effect from any of your blood pressure medications, the best thing to do is to talk to your doctor. They can't read your mind. They won't know your problem with the medication most of the time unless you tell them. I know I can't, I'm not a mind reader, and I've even been in some compromising situations when a patient unfortunately wouldn't tell me right away that they're not taking a medication because of a side effect, but I think they are, and then their blood pressure is not under control, so then the medication dose gets increased, and this could be very dangerous. It happens a lot of times. So communication is key. I'm just, L said, my grandmother takes blood pressure medication and she definitely coughs a lot. So she may be on one of those um, Pril medications called ACE inhibitors. So that's definitely something worth uh, talking to her doctor about. So your doctor, guys, we don't want you to suffer. In fact, if we had it our way, most of us wouldn't even want you to be on a medication for blood pressure in the first place. Um, but for some blood pressure medications or medications in general, they can be a necessary evil. But if your goal is really to get off your medication, please, please express this to your doctor so they can hopefully dig deeper to work alongside you and get you to a point where you may not need medication. And I've typically seen that many people who have the hardest time getting off medications for blood pressure, they're on three or more medicines for blood pressure. They tend to usually have some underlying cause for their high blood pressure or hypertension outside of just genetics or just lifestyle that needs to be investigated further. Um, so if you are on more than three medications or you're on three or more medications for high blood pressure, you may have an underlying cause. Hi, Catherine. Thanks for joining. Hi, Teresa. Thanks for joining. The most common secondary cause um, of under or underlying cause for hypertension. Any guesses of what that could be? What do you think could be one of the, the more common causes for high blood pressure outside of just, it's my genes, I've got it because mom and dad had it, or, um, you know, too much salt or, or you're overweight or, you know, lifestyle stuff. Is there a common underlying cause for hypertension or high blood pressure? Janice says stress. Um, that's correct, Janice. That is a very, very common cause. It's probably the second um, underlying cause. And it actually, it probably is the first. But the issue is that a lot of people with stress um, don't identify it. So that is a common cause, but it's not easily identified by the patient. Um, so the most common cause, underlying cause, secondary is what we call it, cause of hypertension is sleep apnea. So if you're overweight 
or if you're a snorer, even though I've actually seen it in a number of skinny people, and especially, again, if you have hypertension that's hard to control, if you're on three or more medications for your blood pressure, then talk to your doctor about the possible benefit of getting a sleep study done. There are other causes too outside of sleep apnea. There's something called Cushing's disease and that's related to too much of a hormone called cortisol. So that's how we can diagnose it by measuring your cortisol levels in your blood. That's pretty easy. Um, sometimes we have to take urine samples. There's also hypothyroidism, a low functioning thyroid. That's a very common cause of hypertension as well. And even some medications can cause high blood pressure. Birth control pills, for example, they are common culprit to cause high blood pressure. And there are a bunch more, okay? So if you fall in that category, again, of having high blood pressure that's difficult to control, especially despite being on three or more medications, then please speak with your doctor about the possibility that there are more tests that might need to be run, okay? Uh, so thanks for that. Hi, Shanae. Thanks for joining. Okay, so all right. So we've talked about um, what does blood pressure really mean? What are the classifications of blood pressure? Normal versus prehypertension versus stages one and two hypertension and even what's a hypertensive crisis. What does that mean? Um, and when I said that number more than 180 over 110, Basically, that means if you're in hypertensive crisis, or sometimes we call it hypertensive urgency or emergency, depending on what symptoms you have, it means that you are at risk of literally having a stroke or a heart attack like any second now. Um, so that's when we get very, very concerned if your blood pressure is that high. We usually will not want you to leave the office um, with a blood pressure that high, and if we do, um, which are okay with certain guidelines, we want a very close follow-up afterwards. So we also discussed what some of the common other causes of high blood pressure could be outside of genetics and lifestyle, the most common culprit being sleep apnea, okay? So let's discuss what you can do to help lower your blood pressure if it's especially due to the primary reason of your lifestyle. Because like most other chronic diseases, high blood pressure is usually caused by a mismatch between a person's genes and um, their diet and lifestyle, okay? And the good news is that high blood pressure can usually be improved or even completely reversed by implementing a diet and lifestyle that is more consistent uh, with your evolutionary heritage, basically, that's consistent with a time before all the madness of processed foods and crazy technology and a super stressful lifestyle all of the time, etc. Okay, so in addition to that, there are several natural supplements that have been shown to be quite effective in lowering blood pressure. And when you combine the right kind of eating habits and lifestyle with some of the supplements, you can really see a significant difference, okay? So I could go on for quite a while, so I'd like to share five tips, five tips today with you that you can implement to start lowering your blood pressure naturally with the guidance of your doctor, okay? So please, please, please keep your doctor in the loop. Um, even if you are using natural methods to lower your blood pressure, they need to be abreast of what's going on. Um, hi, Joanna, thanks so much for joining. <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk about a, a flavor that starts with the letter S and can play a huge role in your blood pressure. What is it? Let me see what your guesses are. A flavor that starts with the letter S and it can play a huge role in your blood pressure. What do you think I am going to talk about? Do, 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 Okay, so Janice says spearmint, good guess. Then um, I'm seeing salt as well. So I'd actually like to talk to you about 
sugar. Many studies have actually proven that high blood sugar and insulin resistance do contribute to the development of hypertension or high blood pressure. Eating too much sugar, especially the sugar sweetened beverages like soda, sweet tea, and other sugary drinks, that is associated with high blood pressure. So reducing your sugar intake has been shown to lower your blood pressure. High sugar consumption is also associated with higher risk of obesity, of course, type 2 diabetes, and heart disease. There is an 8% increased risk in high blood pressure for every sweetened beverage you drink per day. And that's the 8-ounce drinks I'm talking about not the supersized drinks. So can you imagine what a 36 ounce soda or a 36 ounce sweet tea is doing to you? It could increase your risk of blood pressure by 36%. So try your best to stick with the whole food carbs like veggies, sweet potatoes, and fruit instead of the refined, the processed grains and the sugars. Cutting down your sugar intake will make a major, major difference, major difference in your blood pressure. And we don't talk about that S very often. Now, number two tip, the other S that we're much more familiar with relating to high blood pressure is salt, okay? So there's actually a pretty reasonable debate going on as to if salt actually does have an effect on your blood pressure. Actually, with more recent studies coming to play, the jury is still out. So far, studies are actually showing that it's different for everyone. For many African Americans, salt does have a role in increasing your blood pressure. For other ethnicities, maybe not so much. So what I would best say is to listen to your body. Pay attention to your body. If you know that when you eat a meal, like takeout, for example, if you ate a takeout meal last night and now your blood pressure is high the next morning, there's your answer, okay? You're sensitive to salt. If you've noticed that your salt intake doesn't tend to play a role in your blood pressure increasing, then you may really be on to something. There's actually at least 10 different mechanisms, 10 different ways in which your body um, in which anybody's blood pressure can be high. So that could explain why there are so many different types of medications out there to treat hypertension, right? They're all working to cut down some area of those mechanisms. So it would be reasonable to think that salt intake, it could play a major role with some people, but it may not play a major role with everyone. So the take home here is when it comes to your salt intake, listen to your body and pay attention. I often get the question of which salt is healthiest. Um, I could do an entire live on this topic alone, but to simplify things, there is really, from all the studies out there, there's no best magic salt for the body. Some may contain more minerals than others, but even Himalayan salt, which is widely touted to be the good for you best salt, it still contains 93% sodium chloride, 93% salt. So the good thing about this salt, and others like it though, is that it's not super processed, so there aren't any extra additives to it. So an unrefined sea salt, it'll be more than fine for the sake of your health, okay? It'll still be mostly salt, but also contain some natural amounts of magnesium, potassium, and calcium, okay? So salt is a biggie, but it may not be quite as, um, as important as sugar. Um, Janice asked, do diabetes and high blood pressure go together? Uh, so the mechanism behind uh, developing insulin resistance also contributes significantly to high blood pressure as it does diabetes. So that's why it is very common for people to develop diabetes and high blood pressure. Uh, so hopefully that answers your question. It often does come down to <clears throat> getting insulin resistance and inflammation. Both of those mechanisms make a, play a huge role in developing high blood pressure as well as diabetes.
Okay, so tip number three, speaking of minerals like potassium, magnesium, calcium that are in things like sea salt or um, Himalayan salt, my tip number three involves your intake of potassium. So studies have actually shown that a high diet intake of potassium is associated with lower blood pressure. So the recommended intake of potassium is 4,700 milligrams per day, but the average American only eats and drinks about 2,800 milligrams per day. In fact, the studies show that in the U.S., increasing potassium intake alone would decrease the number of adults with high blood pressure by 17% and increase our life expectancy for over 12 million Americans, okay, just by increasing our potassium uh, intake. So how do you get more potassium in your diet? It's easy. You can eat foods that have a higher content of potassium. What kind of foods do you guys uh, know about that tend to have a lot of potassium in it? Let me know. Um, Simone says a nutritionist told her salt is salt is salt is salt. It's no good salt, really. It's all salt. Um, so yes and no. So that depends on the school of thought. Uh, when you're saying to avoid salt in general, um, then they're saying avoid any kinds of salt no matter what the salt is. And like I said, the studies out there show that salt is not actually as bad as we think, especially depending on the individual. So when it comes to chronic conditions, it really needs to be an individual approach, okay? And um, there are actually some studies out there that are uh, showing that people with low salt intake, it could be in fact as dangerous or even more dangerous um, for them that they have an increased risk of stroke and heart attack from having too low of salt intake. So again, it's a very individual approach that you have to take. All right, so um, hope that uh, addresses your comment. So foods that are high in potassium uh, are foods like halibut, plantains, sweet potatoes, sockeye salmon. Uh, bananas are on the list. I know that a lot of people hear about bananas. Bananas, I've got uh, comments about bananas. But there are actually a bunch of other foods that are much higher in potassium content than bananas, even duck and white mushrooms. My favorite avocados are also quite high in potassium. So if your potassium's low or if you're dealing with high blood pressure and you want to give a try to increasing your potassium intake, you don't have to have all just bananas every day. There's many more foods high in potassium uh, content. So you can just look it up and I'm sure you can uh, see that. All right, so tip number four, along the same lines of foods high in potassium, Oh, I had these pictures and I forgot to even show them to you guys. So tip number one was sugar. Tip number two is your salt intake. Tip number three is your potassium intake, bananas. And tip number four is eat one pound of fatty fish per week. Um, Omega-3 fats in fish are definitely found to reduce your risk of hypertension and heart disease. So if you can help it, try to increase your omega-3 intake with natural foods like fatty fish rather than even fish oil because those would include things like uh, fish like salmon, sardines, halibut, tuna, mackerel, anchovies. And if you do take a fish oil supplement, that's okay. But um, I always advise, give it a whiff, okay? If you uh, take a fish oil capsule, smell it, because I've had some patients bring their medications in when they see me, which I always recommend to do, bring all of your medications in with your doctor so they are 100% sure of what you're actually taking. And I've smelled their capsules, and they smell really fishy. And believe it or not, that's actually not a good thing. That actually means that the contents of your capsule have become oxidized, which is not good. Basically, if your fish oil capsule is fishy smelly, then your capsule contents are rancid and bad. So it could actually do you more harm than good. So throw away the fishy smelling fish oil capsules, please, and get a new pack, okay? Um, thanks, Krista, for joining. 
Uh, Plant-based MD said, yes, oh my gosh, please people, bring the medicines into the doctor. Yes, 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 please. It makes a major difference overall for our ability to know what you're taking because there tends to be a lot of confusion on that regard. So bring your medicines in with you. Bring it in a brown paper bag, throw them all in your pocketbook, whatever. Um, ideally, yes, even in the pill bottles, okay? It's very helpful. All right, tip number five. As for the supplement, let's talk about one called coenzyme Q10, also known as CoQ10. It's a natural antioxidant and it definitely works to protect the heart. It also helps with inflammation and type two diabetes, okay? So at doses of 100 to 225 milligrams per day, CoQ10 can reduce your systolic, that top blood pressure number, by 15 points, and your diastolic, your um, bottom blood pressure number, by 10 points. So keep in mind that CoQ10, it's what we call fat soluble, which means that it's best to take it with meals that contain some type of fat. But there are some newer formulations out there available that you don't necessarily have to take it with a fatty meal, uh, but most of them you do, okay? So I'll be real with you guys. I've really just scratched the surface. There's so much more that can be done to help lower your blood pressure from a natural perspective, but I couldn't keep you on here forever. <laughs> so to help out with spreading more of the info, if you'd like, I did put together a document of 10 tips to naturally lower um, your blood pressure. And it includes a handful of what I mentioned here, but a bunch more, and it's in uh, the comments section, the link on the Facebook page, and I am going to throw up the link um, if I can, again, here in the comments, on, and it's also in the description box, okay? Um, on Instagram, I'm going to find a way to put it up there because uh, we can't hyperlink on Instagram. It's super annoying. Sorry. So definitely um, some info in there that would surprise you. But to sum it up, there are some things you can do aside from just taking your medication that can have a major impact very quickly. Because keep in mind, medications, they do work most of the time, but this is not the end-all, be-all answer. In fact, your medications, they're just hiding your symptoms. It's not truly treating the cause of your disease because your blood pressure, your blood pressure is not because of a deficiency, a lisinopril deficiency, or a HCTZ deficiency, or a Losartan deficiency. There's something else going on, and until you deal with that something else, whether that's your stress, your diet, lack of sleep, a magnesium deficiency, or some other thing, this will unfortunately many times continue to be an uphill battle until you deal with that real root cause or causes. Okay, so again, my hope and my mission is for my patients, my loved ones, our communities to be well, whole, energized, and loving life. So let's get there together. Let's dig deeper. You deserve it. The many intricate processes that had to be so perfect for you to make it here on this earth and the many experiences that you've already dealt with you're here on this earth for a reason, so why not be here and truly enjoy the life that you're living? Feel good when you wake up every day, okay? This is not a far-fetched, it's not a far-fetched dream for most of you, okay? We just have to figure out a real, real plan to get you there. All right, so we discussed five, five effective methods to help lower your blood pressure without medications or that can decrease or really even eliminate, okay, your medications. We talked about, number one, decrease your sugar intake, especially the refined processed carbs, which are the major source of sugar, the sodas, sweet drinks, pastries, desserts, chips, cookies, all that stuff. Um, number two, we talked about salt and how it can be a culprit for a lot of people. It could also be dangerous to lower your salt intake too much. So you've got to pay attention and listen to what your individual body is telling you and discuss with your doctor. 
Number three tip, we talked about the importance of potassium. Many of us are not getting enough potassium in our diet. And even though bananas are a decent source, there's also fatty fish, sweet potatoes, plantains, many other higher sources, okay, to name a few. Number four tip was regarding your intake of omega-3s. So these are a big deal when it comes to your heart health overall. So try to eat at least one pound of fatty fish per week. And fish oil is okay too, but like we talked about, make sure your fish oil hasn't gone rancid or bad. And number five, we talked about the supplement CoQ10, which is chock full of benefits, but one being that it can decrease your blood pressure by about 15 points systolic, top number, and 10 points diastolic, bottom number, if you're taking 100 to 225 milligrams per day. So we discussed a lot today, but I do hope that this information was helpful for you. Was it helpful? Let me know, guys, uh, in the comment section. I would appreciate it. What questions do you have? Let me know, please. And if it was new and helpful info for you, please share this info with others. Um, because if you'd like more info, I, I really want to continue to share valuable, valuable things that will hopefully save a life. But if you'd like more info than what I just shared, click on the link here, um, and I'll give you my free handout on 10 tips to lower your blood pressure naturally. Oh, and I wanted to share with you all, I have an awesome offer, but it's only for limited time. So if you're a resident in the states of Georgia or Pennsylvania, I am now offering free one-on-one -on -one discovery sessions for you to find out if I could be the right fit for you. So I offer a number of different packages as uh, being a, your own primary care physician or just a consultant if you'd like to keep your current primary care physician. So I'd love to chat with you. Um, believe me, the more I'm challenged by my patients, the new patients, the old patients, the better a doctor I can become. So if there are no more questions, I'm going to see you guys next time. But I'm so glad to have you all join with me again today. All right. So until next time, be well, whole, energized, and loving life. Take care, guys.